I'd love to, um, to discuss many of the points made by the previous speaker, but unfortunately I'm limited to three and a half minutes. So, you know, despite all the guff and all the fake indignation we've heard here on the floor of the House about the government being allocated extra time, the longest time I've ever had to, I've ever been allowed to speak here is four minutes since the government took office. Now, there has been a, there has been a, there has been a huge increase there has been a huge increase in, social, in the social welfare budget necessitated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, naturally, I welcome that. I also, there are a number of very, very uh, innovative measures in this budget, in this social welfare bill. And there's also an attempt at targeting, which again, I welcome and I commend the Minister for. So because of the shortness of time, I have to confine myself to speaking on one point. I must, I must confess to being bitterly disappointed that Two years have gone by now without any increase in basic social welfare rates. I've emphasised time and again that inflation for those on social welfare uh, who you know, can only purchase the bare necessities of life, equally for people on very low incomes, is, not, is far in excess, in fact, of headline inflation. That is because there are items included in the headline inflation figures such as yachts, top-of-the-range cars, etc., which the poor will never be purchasing. Studies done by a number of organisations, including the Vincentian Partnership, have shown that, in effect, inflation in relation to the basic purchases of those on social welfare has increased by 5 to 6 per cent over the past two years. Now, the programme for government makes a commitment on page 85 to protect social welfare rates. Now, in my opinion, uh, allowing the purchasing power of social welfare payments to fall does not constitute protection of social welfare rates. And it does appear to make a mockery of the other, other commitment by the government to move to a level of payment of social welfare recipients uh, outlined and, and identified by the Vincentian Partnership and others as being uh, barely necessary to make ends meet. Experience has shown that the weakest in society get left behind when, unless welfare increases keep up with increases elsewhere in the economy. Since 2016, average weekly earnings have increased by 16%, which is exactly double the rate by which social welfare has increased. The inevitable consequence has been that we have failed, we have failed to make significant progress in reducing levels of poverty, despite, despite uh, the, the country enjoying growth rates which are amongst the highest in the world. The, the most vulnerable have been allowed to fall further and further behind. In Ireland, almost 700,000 people are living on incomes below the poverty line, and child poverty rates are amongst the highest in the OECD. We cannot afford to create a permanent and expanding underclass in this country, because if we do, we will have within our society a growing army of people who will remain shackled to poverty indefinitely. And the long-term consequences of this for Irish society and Irish politics will be profound and will not be for the good. One question I had intended to put to the Minister is, does she intend to reform the system whereby uh, increases in the fuel allowance are the only compensation for increases in carbon tax? Because a huge cohort of social welfare people don't get the fuel allowance at all. A, few, a huge cohort of very low income people who rely on fists for their weekly survival or what used to be FIS, don't get the uh, fuel allowance at all. So, you know, are those people expected to just suck up an increase which is being introduced because some people believe that it will change people's behaviour, whatever, whatever about the evidence? 